the season New Jersey tea at Cianothus Americana. Um, it is one of just a very small handful of woody plants that grow in, in prairies in our part of the country. Um, lead plant would be another example. Um, I'm thinking these plants are probably have been here for seven, eight years. I did lose one back. There's two plants here. I lost one back there just this year. Um, I don't know why, except nothing lives forever. Um, one of the things I really like about this is that it is a woody that blooms midsummer. Many of the woody species tend to bloom in the spring. This is a Pocota dogwood back here, which is a small native understory tree in the big woods. This blooms in the spring. You know, a, a lot of the trees and shrubs tend to bloom in the spring. This, however, is in the summer. It's actually just delightful when it's blooming. Excellent pollinator plant. Just will be covered with what I believe they call s s sweat bees. What you see in this garden right now is primarily red zinnias, and this is a type of Nicotiana, um, Nicotiana sylvestris. Neither of these are native, and they are both annuals. The red zinnias are one of the best pollinator plants in my garden, by the way, but I'm supposed to be talking about native, so we'll let them go. But part of the reason this garden has worked out this way is because this area that I'm standing in in the spring, there is a large mass of Virginia bluebells right here. Um, and they go summer dormant, so they die back. And then I've got these big gaps. So I have Virginia bluebells. There's some bloodwood over here. Up here, I've got this little one called violet wood sorrel. There's some shooting stars in here. They all die back. So the annuals get plugged in here to kind of um, take up the space and make it look like the garden's just not dead. But this would be, um, like I said, a plant that, um, you know, is indicative of a pretty mature prairie. I've also read that it can live to be up to 100 years old. So, very long lived. I have some ironweed here. Um, these two are in bloom the same time, and like I said, these tend to kind of fall down here. So I've got these yellow daisy-like things and then the um, the purple ironweed. Uh, it's it's really a fun combination when they're both in bloom, which they obviously are not. I have a lot of purple coneflower in this garden. Um, again, this is an out-of-range native, um, though I think just about anybody who's selling native plants in Minnesota is going to be selling this as a native, despite the fact it's an out of range. Um, what I like about it is that it has probably of the native species that I have here, this probably provides the longest bloom time. Um, I also like the fact that, um, you know, it's a good pollinator plant. And this time of the year, every morning when I walk out of my house, I see dozens of little birds flying out of here, primarily finches. And what they're feeding on is these um, the seeds out of the, the purple coneflower, which is probably a good, good, good time for me to mention um, with most of the species in this rather beleaguered looking garden at this point. Um, I think most of the cutting down, or I see one more thing over there that I'm going to cut down. Most of this I'm going to leave standing over the winter because it's going to provide um, seeds for birds and also the stems. The stems of plants are really useful for cavity nesting bees. So, um, you know, we're all really encouraged to leave this stuff standing over the winter. And from my perspective, it gives me an excuse to put it off till spring. <laughs> so, there's some smaller flowers, which I personally find very appealing. I'm not sure um, everybody agrees with that. A lot of people really like the big Black Eyed Susan hybrids that are about this big around. I just think this is sweet. We, uh, prior to coming here, I was over there talking about the... Um, um, the purple coneflower. One thing I can tell you about this and also the purple coneflowers is that they're very seedy. Um, 
So they drop lots of seeds and so you get lots of little seedlings in the spring. You know, these are probably not a good plant for a small landscape or a small yard. But an interesting plant in that, you know, they are a wonderful pollinator plant. The birds are I should probably tell you, I did collect seeds off this, so you're not seeing a lot of seeds here right now after I talk about leaving the seeds for the birds. But um, a nice little fact point about this plant, if you want to keep a healthier looking plant. <coughs> the reason that this is called cut plant is because the way that these, the leaves form around the stem, it actually forms a little cup here, and water can gather in those little cups and birds come and drink the water out of there, particularly finches. Finches just adore this plant. I mean, there's seeds, there's water, there's a place to perch. Um, this is um, some Indian grass here. I, I mean, I think the coloration in the foliage can be just stunning. The same is true of the little blue stem, though this is not an area of my prairie that has a lot of little blue stem in it. That's further down the road. But, um, you know, some of the things that we have down here that we talked about above. This is a compass plant. I know for a fact that this has been here for four years. It has not yet bloomed. If it had, we would see a, a stalk here of some sort. Um, maybe next year. We're about trying to manage the height of New England asters in a garden because they can get floppy and fall over. They don't do that in the prairie because one, you know, they have all these other plants growing around them which are competing for nutrients and moisture. The other thing is the grasses tend to provide, or, you know, other plants tend to provide some structural support for plants so that they don't fall. It's, they're basically holding them up. I always say, you know, if somebody's planting a native garden, I say, oh, do think about incorporating some grasses in there because they can be kind of like scaffolding almost with some of your other plants to help them stay erect and not flop over. So um, for somebody who's giving a talk on native plants, it's, this seems like a really odd place to start, but I was remembering where Robert left off, which was directly across the road from this. and. If I stand on that road, this is what I look at. And what I can tell you is that you are looking at more than two miles of contiguous crop. There's not a fence row, there's not a tree line. There is a little homestead right up there. But, um, and I've lived here for 32 years. This has changed dramatically. There used to be trees, there were fence lines, there were little patches and groves of trees. There were places for things to live and they don't live there anymore. As somebody who's trying to promote native plants, I feel like one of the things that's most important for me to do is to try to inspire others. And so my message to you here is if you think that if just because you live on a small lot or a suburban or city lot, that what you have to, you know, you can't contribute, I would argue forcefully that you're wrong. I think that inside of any good suburban lot, you could provide more native plantings than occurs in this two square miles. So just something to think about. I gotta quit moving that purse cursor around. Um, so I've come to native plants, maybe not as directly as um, a lot of growers have. Um, I spent 30 years at the St. Paul Farmer's Market this picture was probably taken in my last three or four years. And as you can see on the side of the truck, I also did perennials, more traditional perennials, and I did herbs as well, culinary herbs. Towards the end though, I pretty much just focused on um, um, native plants. Um, part of my journey and part of, the, you know, part of the reason I switched to native plants, um, a couple of reasons that I think I can exemplify here. Um, one was I was growing cut flowers, which was one of the little niche corners I tried at the market. Um, and one of the things I learned growing a lot of flowers, including the native plants, was that where I saw the most activity in my garden was inside the native plants. There was, that's where I would see the most butterflies, the most bees, 
the most birds. So it was kind of like an intriguing awakening to me is that this is where things want to live. And that kind of became my internal rallying cry is I want my garden to be a place where I can go where things live. Um, the other thing was, is that the cut flowers were just, um, it, it wasn't making economic sense. And at some point I said, I'm through with cut flowers, I'm growing natives. And so that was kind of like a pivotal turning point in my journey. So um, again, I just am wanting to inspire people a little bit. So we'll start out with a, a definition here of a native plant. Um, I'm sure that, you know, anybody who's um, a master gardener has probably seen these definitions before. It is one that was growing naturally in a specific area before white or European settlement. Um, but then, you know, that's a pretty broad definition. Um, so it can be, you know, on the purest, purest end of the spectrum, it can mean strictly local genotypes. And that means like only stuff that was growing within X number of miles from this spot right here. That's the only thing that's truly a, um, a, a native. A total opposite end of that spectrum would be um, cultiv cultivated natives, or some people call them um, um, native ours. Um, so I think that there's this whole broad spectrum. Um, I tend to be pretty generous in what I consider um, natives. My motivation has always been not to have people be purists, but to get them to get more native plants into their landscape. So I think local genotypes, that purest definition, that's really appropriate if you're doing a restoration um, project. So if you're restoring um, you know, a, a native prairie or a prairie remnant or something, then I think it's really um, important that you talk about local genotypes for home gardening. I think you can go pretty far over this way. I will tell you straight up, I am not a, not a fan of native cultivars at all. But I am pretty loosey goosey in, um, you know, I think it's okay to have plants that are native outside of what I call out of out of range plants. And I think I referred to that a little bit when I was walking around my garden. Good, well known examples of out of range plants would be purple coneflower, the blue false indigo. Those are all technically not within our native range, but I think they're wonderful garden plants. They're open pollinated natives. They've not been adulted, adulterated, and I think they're great garden plants. So if we look at native plants, we can, we've got different categories. We've got forbs, flowers, forbs, which are also flowers, grasses and sedges, woody plants, such as trees, shrubs, and woody vines, and then ferns, mosses, and I suppose I've never been able to figure out if mushrooms are plants or animals. So, you know, but, you know, we have some pretty cool native mushrooms too, so. Um, I can back up here and say that mm, most of my experience and my growing is um, focused on the forbs, the grasses and sedges, just a few of the woody plants, ferns and mosses, and mm, no better than your average kid on the street. So why grow native plants? Um, because they are adapted to local conditions. They've evolved here. Um, not only have they evolved here, but they have co-evolved with, you know, the insects and the birds that live that live here. So they kind of are an important piece of that local web. They are not likely to become invasive. Um, they require less, and we can talk a little bit more about what anybody thinks invasive is. They require less water and fertilizer. They attract wildlife. Um, and then there are, um, excellent selections for shady areas. And I always like to point this out to gardeners because um, if you live in a lot with a, you know, a mature lot, you're gonna, have, you're gonna have some shade. And so you're looking for shady options. And I believe that nat native plantings need not, look, need not be weedy looking. It's a little bit subjective, I know, but. So natives require less water and fertilizer. Um, I can say that fertilization and overwatering should be avoided, especially with prairie and other dryland species. Um, woodland species, on the other hand, probably like a little bit um, more moisture and, and 
a slightly higher fertility. And if you want higher fertility in a shady area, I really recommend compost as opposed to a commercial fertilizer. Native plants attract wildlife, and this includes birds, butterflies, other pollinators, snakes, frogs, toads, you know, you name it. Like I said, there's nothing, in my opinion, better than going to my garden in the morning and seeing who's hanging out here today. Um, so they provide nectar, seeds, and larvae food. Um, woody plants are also very beneficial in that they provide berries, larvae food, um, and cover. Um, I should have a comma there, but, um, and I don't mention a, a lot of them are great nectar plants too. Okay, and native plantings need not be weeding looking. They can be rambunctious, but yeah. So some of the suggestions that I give to people, who, you know, when they're talking about, well, how do I design a native garden? Um, and I don't consider myself a, a designer. I consider myself a person who's had a modicum of success through immense amounts of success and failure. Um, but, you know, some things that I have learned are, one, you can incorporate traditional design concepts or not. And by that, I mean, you know, you can go for matching color schemes. You can remember to put the tall ones in the back and the short ones in the front. I do encourage you to kind of think about having blooms all year long, um, kind of the same stuff you, same ideas that you're gonna use with any sort of garden. Um, you can use non-natives or not. Um, you know, once again, I am not a purist and as long as you stay away from those things that, you know, one are invasive species or, you know, or maybe, oh, I do have some plants that I think are just way overused. I mean, please stop with the Carl Forrester when we have so many native grasses that are very attractive. So, um, but otherwise, you know, you did see in one of my gardens, I put in tons of red zinnias to fill in where the ephemerals have died out. Um, and they're a great pollinator plant and everybody who comes here loves them. <coughs> Excuse me. I think this one, create a sense of intention. I think that's profoundly important. Make it look like you want it to look that way and it will not look as messy. And some ways that you can do that is to add focal features like paths, sculptures, hardscaping, birdhouses, bird baths, and whatnot. Make it look like it's on purpose. Um, you know, again, we talked about grasses. Grasses, um, they provide some structure in your garden. And they also actually are very functional too in that they provide shelter for um, particularly a lot of butterflies. There are a few butterflies that um, are dependent upon um, some very specific grasses, prairie drop seed, for example, for their, um, for their, for their um, larvae stages of their plant uh, life cycles. Um, so they have function and structure. Plus I think they can really just add to a native garden. And then finally is um, to use your imagination. I view any garden, whether it be a, a native garden or a non-native garden is, I think it, it's kind of like a personal, like it's your own piece of art. It's, you know, it's your opportunity for expression. When people ask me, should I do this? Do I have to do that? Should I do this? You know, I just kind of stare at them and say, it's your garden. It's your garden. You can do whatever you want. And I think that that's true in a native garden as well as in any garden. So a few more points. Um, groupings of the same species attract, meaning that if you have like a, a clump of one species, that's gonna be a lot more attractive to um, pollinators and to birds. It's, you know, they can see it better. And then once they get there, you know, they've got a little area where they can work around and get lots of food all in the same place. So. Groupings are good. I know that's not everybody's style, but just something to keep in mind. No personalities. Um, um, and we, I talked a little bit about um, some plants that, you know, have a million seeds on them in our CDs. Um, so, you know, learn your plant personalities. Are they seeders? Meaning that they spread seeds all over. Do they spread by underground runners or roots? Are they spring ephemerals, meaning that they're going to die? I'm not supposed to say the word. They're going to, um, uh, the top is going to go away. I don't want to say die because they're not really dead. They're dormant. They're going to go dormant in the summer. Um, so you're not going to see them. And then you're going to have these kind of ugly gaps. And so that's something you want to manage for. 
Um, I sometimes actually go so far as to think about um, what plants I want to put behind something because they have what I call ugly legs. A lot of the asters are like this in particular, I think. So, you know, if I have, um, I put some New England asters in a garden a couple of years ago and I made sure that they were kind of in the back. Well, they're tall, so that makes sense. But something, something with dense foliage in front of them to kind of cover up those ugly, ugly legs. I don't know how else to say it any nicer. Okay, um, learn your seedlings. Um, so um, this means you wanna be out in your garden a lot early in the season. And I think that's when most of us are really most motivated in our gardens um, and, and, and just observe, observe, observe. Just spend time out there. Sometimes I feel like I can go out in the garden and I should be out there weeding and really all I do is spend an hour staring at stuff. And one might think that that's a waste of time, but I think that's time very well spent, very well spent. And again, deadheading and shovel work are useful practices and don't be afraid to get rid of stuff. Once again, the compost pile, respectable. Okay, last thing here. Things to leave. I wish I could come up with 50 things and then I could call it 50 ways to leave your garden or something like that. Um, leave seed heads for the birds. Leave stalks for cavity nesting birds. That's particularly true for um, um, ne cavity nesting bees, I'm sorry. Particularly if you take note that they have hollow stems, all of the milkweeds are gonna fall into this category. It's that cup plant that we were talking about. Um, will fall into that category. Those are great places for critters to hang out over the winter. Leave some litter for overwintering insects, including pollinators. I believe that the swallowtail butterfly um, overwinters and leaf litter on, on the ground. So, so leave some litter and then leave some bare soil too for ground nesting bees. And leave some standing dead wood, or as we like to say, snags. I know that in gardens, that's not really maybe applicable, but um, you know, if you have an opportunity to leave standing dead wood on your property, boy, I really encourage that too. And then the best thing to leave is the need for absolute order or control. But you know, you guys are gardeners, so you know that. So um, I just um, pulled this picture because it shows that, you know, I thought this is nice. Here's some litter, here's some bare soil, here's some sweet prairie flax. Here's some dandelions. So we got everything to leave. Your sense of control, no, I can't get all the dandelions, but I've left some soil, I've left some, some mulch, got a little bit of everything here. And, and here's some, um, you know, again, I wanted to kind of emphasize this dead stock thing. This is actually swamp milkweed. This was left standing over the winter. This is after I cut it down in the spring. And even at that point, I left about a foot of it standing because there may well be um, insects nesting closer to the ground down in there. And the other thing that's just wonderful about this, if you notice the shredding of the material there, this, this is the, uh, all of the milkweeds have these really fibrous stems and, and this shredding is from birds collecting the shreds to nest with. So there's another reason to leave some of those stocks because it's gonna, it's gonna provide some nesting material. So um, from here, I'm gonna go on. My, the next thing I'd like to do is just show you, I've got about a dozen pictures here of um, some native gardens. Um, I think I've got three or four different gardeners represented here. Um, again, I wanna inspire you and you know maybe kind of drive home some of the points I've tried to make already. So this is actually um, in my garden, I think Richard, had me standing there back here. No, I don't see any cut plants back there, but okay, same garden. This is, um, you know, probably a good example of, of put something in there that makes it look like it's on purpose. This feature here, that is actually an old uh, tractor part. I forgot what it's called, but yeah, I found that. So the next three or four pictures are this, this garden is in Edina, Minnesota. And I believe this is pretty much a purist native garden. Um, I like what they've done with, um, you, you know, it, it, again, if you make it look intentional, I mean, they've got this nice hardscaping and 
you know, this stuff grouped around it, stick a little bluebird house or I mean, little bird house in there. And um, I, this doesn't look messy to me at all. I think it looks grand, just grand. Um, this is looking a, a farther out, same garden. Again, some nice hardscaping. Um, you know, and I think even though there's not an abundance of stuff blooming here right now, I love the textural variation in here. There's some grasses, and I believe that this is probably some prairie drop seed in here, some liatris that are going to be blooming soon. There's the purple coneflower in the backdrop. And I think that these are that, um, um, that New Jersey tea shrub that I talked about. This garden is in the heart of St. Paul. It's on Cleveland Avenue. Um, this is Paul and Susan Damon. Amazing, it's, Susan's just an amazing gardener. She was a wonderful customer of mine at market the whole time I was there. She lives in that garden when she's not at work. And this is the walkway. So this says she's got the boulevard planted here as well as, I think she just has little grass paths going around the yard. This is um, the backside of her house next to the garage. Oh, I lied. So she does have some palace purple hookah there on the left-hand side, if you can see. But, um, you know, again, this is more of a shaded area. And I think she just has a wonderful eye for um, combining things. Um, and she takes really nice care of stuff too, so. Um, this is kind of maybe in a wilder section of her garden, but I think, Again, just the placement of that structure there makes it look like this is how it's supposed to be. So she's got lots of cup plants here. That's the one I said might not be suitable for um, a small lot. Um, and she does, you know, every spring she does, she just throws hundreds of these little seedlings away. She tries to give them away and then finally ends up throwing them away. So we're composting them. And this is the you know, a front of her house, kind of behind that sidewalk shot that we had earlier. And this is, I think, you know, probably the messiest place, messiest looking part of her gardens, but I still think that this is just absolutely delightful, the way the grasses and the flowers are playing together. And she's given it that sense of intention with the sign there. And yeah, this is one more. I just, just love this color combination. This is some, um, purple coneflower and a um, prairie prairie onion, both natives. Yeah. And the last one here, we've got some um, ironweed back here. We've got some queen of the prairie, a philopendula, um, some monarda down here, purple coneflower, um, Michigan lily. Delightful little choice plant, not easy to grow, but uh, this is actually one of my favorite shots that I ever took in my garden. This is fireweed in the background, and this is two kinds of milkweeds here, swamp milkweed and, and the butterfly weed, and I call this from the fire, I call it fire and milk. I just love that combination. And you know, one of the things I've learned about gardening with native plants is I never pay much attention to what color combination is going on. You know, so that's one of those traditional design concepts that I just decided, yeah, don't matter. I do kind of go for, I like to have stuff blooming all summer long, but you know, had you told me, why don't you put some hot pink next to orange? I would have said you're nuts, but my God, I love that. Yeah. And then, you know, this is a more, um, not so much a backyard garden. This is at the Children's Museum in Owatonna, Minnesota. There's um, um, a local, uh, native grower down in that neck of the woods. His name is Dustin Demmer, and he's with um, Blazing Star Gardens. He does a lot of um, contract um, design and installation and stuff. And um, I think this is just a uh, uh, you know, I like this. It's got chaos, but it, it looks intentional, intended, um, and like it's supposed to be exactly like this. This, I actually asked him if I could use this, um, this photo for a presentation that I was doing or a little article that I was writing on prairie drop seed. And this, this the prairie drop seed is fe featured really nice here. Beautiful native grass. It's this big one here in the foreground. Beautiful native grass. 
start out with shade species and then we'll, I'll go into some sun species. I'm hoping I won't run out of room. I think there's about 50 of them and I'll try to be real brief with each of them. So, but you know, I know everybody likes to look at pretty plants. So, yeah. So for the shade, um, wild ginger, I think is one that's, you know, becoming actually quite familiar. I refer to it as um, um, native hosta makes a wonderfully dense ground cover in shaded areas. It will actually take a relatively dry shade and look good there most of the year. I have it in quite dry conditions and it looks great until we get into the really dry dog days of late summer. Um, this is Bishop's cap. This is a low growing plant. It's in the saxifrag family, meaning it's related to um, things like coral bell. Um, and it's slow, it's a slow spreader. Um, I personally, the spot I have in my garden, I would like it to be spreading a little bit faster, but this is a spreading plant that is definitely well behaved, definitely um, grows in very shady conditions, blooms in the spring. Um, these little flowers are shaped kind of like a bishop's cap, hence the name. And it's, it's a wonderful early plant, early pollinator plant. Here's bellwort. Um, this is also called sometimes um, lady bells, I believe. Um, it's, it, it's, it's just stunning. It is a, an ephemeral um, and with all, as with all of the ephemerals, it is just stunning in its beauty. Uh, and disappointing in its brevity. I mean, these are in bloom for, uh, you know, maybe five days at most, but, um, you know, when they're in bloom, you just need to go out there and look at them every day. I don't have this in my garden. I have um, blood root in my garden and I feel pretty much the same way about that. Go out and look at it every day because it's only here for five days. Virginia bluebells. Um, this is in my garden. Again, this is an ephemeral. Um, this one has a, um, a much longer blooming period, which is nice. In a cool spring, this can be blooming for three to four weeks in my garden. Beautiful color, beautiful plant until it decides to go dormant. And then it's, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, this one is maybe not quite as deep. It won't take quite as deep a shade as the Virginia bluebells, but um, you know, it's a really, really tough plant. It will grow in semi-shade. It will also grow in full sun, kind of blooms the latter end of summer, which I think is nice if you're working in a, you know, kind of in a shaded area because so much of that stuff blooms early in the spring. So I'm kind of always thinking, well, what will bloom, you know, maybe a little bit later in the season where it's not so sunny. And this, this fits the bill. It's about a foot tall too, so it's not really overpowering. Um, Native Jacob's Ladder, um, which is different than, you know, the more, um, maybe the more, the more common trade industry Native uh, Jacob's Ladder, which tends to run a foot and a half, two feet, even three feet tall. Um, this little thing is under a foot tall. Um, it grows in very, quite, sh quite shaded areas. Um, and again, doesn't need a terrible amount of moisture. So um, this has been very, very happy at my place. Um, native columbine. Uh, this one, I think everybody um, everybody's familiar with columbine. Um, you know, there's lots of wonderful columbine cultivars. I can assure you, neither the hummingbirds nor the pollinators are going to like them anywhere near as much as this native columbine. This is like the one you want in your garden for when the hummingbirds get here in the spring. Absolutely. It's the, you know, other than that, the, the tree blossoms, this is the first thing that they're going to find. To, though actually they like that. They do like that Virginia bluebell too. So, but this is a great hummingbird plant. Just great. Oh boy, I meant to take that out. Uh, hmm. This is an out of range native. Um, I just would like this removed, Bob. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Canadian violet. Um, this is a little bit different than the traditional um, common violet that we all think of that grows in our lawn and everywhere. You know, this this little sweetheart is very, you know, it does throw about a bunch of seeds too. All the violets are shooters, meaning they, you know, their seeds can get dispersed several feet away, away from where they are. 
Um, I've not found this to be like, you know, where I'm growing it, it's not all over the place in my lawn as the purple one is. It's white. I am drawn to white flowers um, and it's tough as nails. And I think, you know, provides a nice contrast in that um, spring garden. I'm always trying to get people to plant white things. Jack in the pulpit, we all know that. Um, not much to speak of in the way of blooming, but I, it's kind of an interesting plant does real well in the shade. Um, wild geranium. Um, this is one that can be a pretty aggressive spreader by um, rhizomes. Um, it's beautiful in the spring for a couple of weeks. Um, and then the foliage can start to look a little bit ratty. This is a great time for me to say, you know, if, um, actually both this and that little Jacob's Ladder that I talked about before, their foliage can start to look a little bit tired once we get into say July when it starts to get kind of hot and dry. Um, my, my way of dealing with this is to, just to shear it to the ground. And I mean, literally to the ground. I've been known to take a weed whip off after some plants like this sometimes. So, you know, a nice knife right at soil level will do a good job too. You will immediately get refreshed foliage and it just, you know, it's not gonna bloom again, but it looks better my opinion anyway. Canada anemone, um, this one is very aggressive. Um, but you know, sometimes that's what you want in a plant. If you have a damp, a dampish, fairly shady area, um, this is a, a great plant that'll fill in landscape for if you want. And I take note here, there's a little bit of this, um, no, that's something else, yeah. Um, I've never carried this plant for sale because I've had so many people complain about how awful it is. But I do know people who have grown and said, you know, for the situation that they're growing it in, it's just perfect. So, you know, a road, a shady road ditch is a great spot. <laughs> okay, Solomon's Seal. Um, I like this plant. It's, it's got sweet little flowers on it. And actually these are great little pollinator plants. I mean, flowers. Um, but I like this, I think of it as an architectural plant. I've got another one coming here to this um, American Spike Nard, which I think, I just think that the, the foliage and the arch on it, it just provides nice architecture in the garden. If I could just keep the deer from eating it, um, man, they just eat that to the nubs, so. Oh, here it is, the, the American Spike Nard. Um, this not as well known as um, the Solomon Seal, but um, I just really like the shape or what I call the architecture of this plant. Um, you know, this is a nice plant that, you know, it's, you, you can put little plants underneath it. This is uh, in the top here, this is actually the flower in the spring, this greenish looking thing not much to write home about, but it gets these really attractive berries on it late in the season. I don't know of anything that eats, or, you know, I don't think the berries attract anything. I keep, when I used to have it, you know, in berry like that, I would go on saying, you know, is anybody eating these? Or are there little, any, any bugs in there? And it's just like, they would just, the whole little clump would look perfect every day until they just shriveled up and died away. So I don't know, I wanna think they have some purpose, but I haven't figured it out yet, so. Oh, and Shooting Star. This is kind of, I wouldn't call this really a shade plant. I would say it's, um, you know, it will grow in semi-shade. It will grow in full sun, but doesn't wanna be terribly hot. Um, so, but if you've got the right spot for this, this stuff is just, Beautiful, this is one of the plants that I have in that mm, garden along with uh, Virginia bluebells that I end up filling it in at the end of the year with the red zinnias because everything has kind of gone dormant. Um, these are in bloom for um, a longer period of time than say the bloodroot or the, the um, lady bells, um, kind of along the lines of the, um, um, the Virginia bluebells. So you're gonna get a couple, three weeks out of this. And it, it always catches everybody's attention. It's really an interesting plant. Um, okay. Um, and this is 
thimble weed. There's a couple different kinds of thimble weed. This is Canadian thimble weed. This will grow in a decent amount of shade. Um, it's taller and it's later, again, it's later blooming. And like I said, I'm oftentimes looking for something that will grow in that shade or partial shade that's not necessarily in the spring, but a little bit later in the season. And this kind of fits the bill. Golden Alexanders, um, that's a pretty rambunctious plant, semi-shade plant. Um, you know, this blooms early in the season. Um, it can be kind of messy looking, but boy, it's got so many positive attributes. This is just a wonderful pollinator plant and it's it's there early enough, um, you know, when, when there might not be a whole lot there for the insects. It is also the larvae host for um, um, more than one kind of swallowtail butterfly. So really useful plant. I have a bank of this behind my greenhouse, greenhouse with um, this yellow and it blooms at the same time as the blue spider wart. Um, it's a fun combination. Great blue lobelia. Um, I think people are very aware of the cardinal flower, which this is sister to the cardinal flower, same genus, different species. This is, um, um, I, you know, everybody loves a cardinal flower. That, that red is just stunning, beautiful. It is a princess plant though, make no mistake about it. The moisture has got to be perfect, you know. Um, it's not terribly long lived. Um, whereas this great blue lobelia, um, it will, it's got a much, much more tolerant of, of drier soils. Um, it blooms a little bit longer. Um, and in my garden, it's kind of, it is going to have to go and, 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 you know, weed out some of the seedlings in the spring. So it self sows readily. It's a great hummingbird plant. Um, even, you know, I know we know that the red one is, but this one, actually the hummingbirds like it, I think every bit as well. So I, like I said, I fully admit it's not as striking as the red one, but it's a much easier plant to grow. There, there are grasses that grow in the shade also. This one being ivory sedge, I kind of picked this one because it's maybe not so common as some of the things like, oh, bottle brush grass is a pretty um, well-known native grass. Um, there are a, an assortment of sedges that actually, it's amazing how many sedges there are native to Minnesota. Um, more sedges than grasses, I believe. Actually, I'm positive of that. Um, and this one is nice. It's short. It's under a foot tall. It grows in dry shade. So, you know, it's got a lot that makes it attractive to native gardeners. But there are um, a lot of sedges. Many of them grow in, grow in shade or semi-shade. There's a fair number of them that need a fair amount of moisture. So you want to um, pay attention to what the cultural needs are when you're looking at different sedges. So in good sun, you know, now we're moving on from, from shade into sun. Um, if you've got good sun, what you're looking at is probably um, many dry prairie species. Though, you know, in addition to prairies, there are, mm, sometimes people refer to, you know, there's wetter places than just dry prairies too, that, you know, a lot of sunny species are gonna do well in. So you might hear the term, um, sometimes people refer to meadows and that might re kind of is my understanding of that means that, you know, it's probably damper than you t tend to think of a prairie or a wet prairie or along, um, you know, the, the, the edges of swales or water bodies kind of thing. Um, and, and probably most importantly is, um, you know, in rain gardens, um, you, you're gonna want some species that, you know, like sun, but, you know, they're also gonna want some moisture, so. So many dry prairie species. And I would like to point out once again that when you're in a prairie where these guys normally would grow, they are very accustomed to, to, to competition for moisture and nutrients, which means that when you put them into a garden and they're, they've been well tended, they're probably the fertility is higher, it's not so much competition, they can get very exuberant, meaning that they can sell so meaning that they might not stand up. They're just so lush that they fall over. Farmers refer to corn lodging. I think plants lodge otherwise too. Um, 
So, you, you know, it, it's just kind of something to keep in mind that um, people will tell me that, you know, I grew this in my garden. My God, I saw it in the roadside and it looked like this and I put it in my garden. I can't believe it. It's eating my garden. And that's, yeah, that's what happens when um, you don't have that natural competition for moisture. So plan accordingly. And this is another good reason to think about using some grasses. So you, you know, you've got provided that structure, you're providing some competition and you're also providing a fair amount of function in doing that. So, and I, my philosophy on watering is that you water during establishment. In other words, when the plants are first put in the ground and then probably you shouldn't really need to water too much after that, unless they're under, you know, moisture stress. When we get those really extended dry periods, but for the most part, these sunny species um, they're going to make it okay. One of the things about the prairie plants in particular is that they have exceedingly deep roots and so they can go to great lengths to um, find moisture and we're talking 10, 12 feet, not two or three deep. Um, and again with, with these species and particularly deadheading pruning, digging are all useful. I think you can kind of see a theme here. Like, don't be afraid to keep these guys in check. So some of, again, my, probably some are my favorite or some of the sunny species that I think are particularly well adapted for garden situations. Number one on the list um, is butterfly weed. This was hands down, um, I did sell herbs, so basil, and butterfly weed, the two bees, those were the, um, uh, what would we call them, mortgage lifters. I, you know, I couldn't, I could never have enough butterfly weed um, on my truck when I went to market. It sold out. Every plant I ever took to market would sell out every day. Maybe that's an overstatement, but damn close to the truth. Um, this is a milkweed, so it's larvae food for the monarch butterflies. Um, it is also a pollinator plant for just a whole host of things. And it's just, you gotta admit, it's stunningly beautiful. And don't ever try to dig this out of a little ditch, by the way. This is swamp milkweed, again, a milkweed, a sister to the butterfly weed. Um, I really like this plant a whole lot too. It does require some moisture, growing a little bit of shade, but um, mostly sun is better. Um, on, in, on my property anyway, in my gardens, I struggle to keep this growing because it's so dry here. But when I do have this plant, it is hands down the favorite of the monarch butterfly larvae. This is the one I'm gonna find the most caterpillars on. Um, yeah, white Baptisia. Um, you know, I think the, 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 the blue Baptisia has gotten to be pretty common in the um, native plant trade. The blue is actually, again, an out of range native and the blue used to be my favorite native plant. Um, but I switched allegiance and now the white's my favorite native plant in Minnesota. Um, I, just, I, I just love the, um, the, the, the contrast of that, the, 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 the color of the stalk, which is kind of this purplish color, purplish gray. I don't know what these cream blossoms. Um, this is a really long lived plant. I can tell you this picture was taken in an area where I used to have a cut flower garden and then I abandoned it. And this is probably 10, 12 years after abandoning it. Um, and, you know, a lot of things died, died away, went away. This white Baptisia persisted until the day it got tilled under. And actually it persisted for a while after that too. <laughs> <laughs> kept coming back. I let a farmer grow that field down. And um, yeah, it, it wasn't easy getting rid of that stuff. It's a great plant for hummingbirds, believe it or not. Um, and it's early, so that's a good thing. Um, it'll be blooming shortly after the hummers arrive here. Um, and I can tell you that I have had both the blue and the white growing in the same garden. And if I'd look out there, I could often see hummingbirds in the white one and I never saw them on the blue one. Just saying. Metal Blazing Star. Um, so when Jim and I used to sell this at market, we caught, we caught monarch crack. Uh, if we were being a little bit more um, civilized, we would say, if you plant it, they will come. And, 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 and that is so true. 
This is one of many liatris. Um, I think we have something like five or six liatris species that grow in Minnesota. I think they're all fabulous. Um, what I can tell you is those that have this looser um, habit to them as opposed to the dense spikes, this, this more loose open habitat, the, butters, the butterflies definitely prefer that format than spike. I think the, the, it's very simple. They have better places, better landing spots. How's that? Yeah. This grows by a corm. It's a, it's, it's, it's a great garden species. Um, in a garden, again, because it doesn't have that competition, the corms can get kind of like just overwhelming and start to lift out of the ground after a few years. So at that point, um, I would suggest digging it up, maybe breaking it apart and, and replanting the corms. Um, it just doesn't have things to keep it in check. Um, and if it gets that large, it can actually heave itself out of the soil. So here's Prairie Blazing Star. This is an example of the, you know, what I, as I said, the more um, dense um, format on the Blazing Star. It's a nice plant too. And it's just a matter of personal preference. I happen to like the other format better. Um, this is Prairie Blazing Star. I think the one that's been widely available in nursing trade, for nursery trade for a long time is, per, um, um, it's just called gay feather. I think sometimes it's called swamp blazing star, though that's kind of a misnomer. Um, spike blazing star, dense blazing star. It has the same sort of dense shape to it. It comes in a white cultivar. Um, yeah. Prairie smoke. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with this plant. I, you know, I just think this is a wonderful little plant one because it's so unusual, it, it, two, because it's wonderfully tough. Um, when I say un, unusual that, you know, what you're looking at there is the flower um, and, and the seed heads are starting to form. But, you know, if you look down here at the bottom, this is basically the flower. No, it doesn't get any more open that, than that. That's the flower. But, and, 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 and everybody who sees it, they, they're, they're kind of smitten with it. So um, it's, uh, a fun plant. It's very short. So I think it's very useful for um, creating that sense of intention. You know, you can put it along the edges, um, you know, just like you would with in traditional design concepts, kind of have something that's sort of low growing. So in between the flowering, um, this is the flower and then the seed head starting to form here. You know, this is going to look interesting for a really long time. Um, you know, so you've got something going on on the top of the flower for about, you know, more than a month. And then, you know, then that kind of starts to look a little bit scraggly. You can cut it all the way back, um, leave the basal foliage, um, and it just is a nice foliage effect there. In other words, the foliage doesn't get kind of, a lot of plants like after they bloom, the foliage can look kind of funky. The foliage on this tends to persist pretty attractively. So great plant. Wild petunia. Um, this blooms late summer. Again, this is another um, shorter species. It's actually right next door to those um, um, prairie smoke that we just looked at. Um, this is one that I cut the seed heads off of in the fall because it just, I mean, it sows all over the place and it is a forceful shooter. So meaning that I'll find little seedlings you know, five feet away from where this plant was at. So um, I, and, and they all germinate pretty well. <laughs> and not only that, but once it germinates, it's, um, it's not easy even as a, a tiny seedling to just pull it out. You literally have to dig out the, in, in, you know, get something like a dandelion tool down there and get the um, individual seedlings out. So I do try to get all of the seed heads off this in the fall. Um, native bee balm, um, yeah, just, I, it, it's hard to get a better pollinator plant than this. Um, and it's such a classic Minnesota prairie plant that um, you can't talk about sunny natives in Minnesota without um, including this plant. I, I like it because it's aromatic. Um, you know, I've got it growing in the prairie and it just, you know, it occurs in beautiful drifts. Um, it's, it's just enchanting when it's in bloom. 
down there. I admit I don't have it in a garden right now. I have in the past. It is very, very seedy also. Um, this, and I could mention Anna's hyssop is very similar in that it's very, very seedy. They're both members of the mint family. They don't spread by underground runners like we think of as tradition, you know, um, culinary mint, but they are prolific self sowers. The good news is that they're easy to rogue out in the spring, you, you know, just a hoe we can weed them out easily enough. Sky blue aster, um, great late summer color. I really encourage gardeners, people who are doing native gardeners, gardens to include a liatris, an aster, and a goldenrod in their gardens. I don't think I've included any goldenrods in this talk. The reason being, you know, I am a kind of a, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm passionate about the monarch butterflies. I'm, I'm very concerned about their decline. Um, and I think there's a lot we're learning. There's a lot we still need to learn. One thing that I do know is when, before the monarchs make that migration south, they need to fuel up. They really, really need nectar late in the season. Their best bets at getting that are the asters and the golden rods. And I include liatris in there. Mm, you know, they tend not to be as late blooming as say the asters and the golden rods, but the monarchs do love them immensely. So, you know, if, if, if you are on my mission with the monarchs, you will have an aster, you will have a golden rod and you will have a liatris. Um, this is prairie coreopsis. I'm a little bit different than the coreopsis um, that most, you know, the larger, the, I believe, grandiflora, the coreopsis that um, we're more, maybe more familiar with. This is called coreopsis, the, the botanical, and this is coreopsis palmata. Um, I like it because it's got wonderful, just really attractive foliage that stays attractive all season long. Um, I wish the blooms were a little bit longer, maybe a couple weeks in there, but yeah. Oh, and here, I do have the anise hyssop in here. Yeah, anise hyssop. Um, you know, again, this is another quintessential dryland species um, in Minnesota. Great pollinator plant. This has a really nice long bloom period too. It's tall, it can run four to five feet um, and it's seedy also. I think I even see a bee in there somewhere, but, and, and, and again, wonderfully fragrant. It's in that mint family. Anise hyssop, it's got kind of an anise fragrance to it. That's really nice. Downy wood mint, oh gosh, we are heavy on the mints here. This is a spring bloomer, much lower growing, much less inclined to um, um, self sow all over the place, or I like to say create progeny. Um, so I think of it as being a little bit like the cat mint, if people are familiar with that, you know, forms these nice little clumps with these, you know, not too tall lavender spikes on it. Yes, of course, it's a um, yeah, pollinator plant. This is blue-eyed grass. Um, this is another one that, um, you know, if you kind of think back to where I had the, the, um, Prairie smoke and the wild petunia. This is kind of, again, in the front end of that garden where I kind of keep some low stuff stacked. This, this thing is just delightful and it's running crazy in my garden. And I have other people tell me that, you know, they, it just barely limps along. So I think it's, um, it needs fairly dry conditions, which um, I have at my place. Um, and it's, it's just stunning when it's blooming. Um, it doesn't, it, the, the blooms open up every day. Um, and if it's an overcast day, it will not, it, you know, it's just too shy and it won't open up. And I go out there and I have to tell them how disappointed I am that they're not open today. But when it does open up, my God, it's delightful. Purple prairie clover, great plant. Um, dryland prairie species, pollinator plant. It's wonderfully attractive. Um, longer blooming than some and I it's not real obvious in this photo but it's um delightful foliage this really ferny foliage um it's on the shorter side too I would say 
typically under two feet. And, you know, I, it'd be a good opportunity to mention that, um, you know, when I say, yeah, and people, you know, when you're talking about height, because these are open pollinated, they're, you know, genetically diverse, so they can, you know, I mean, I've seen butterfly weed that are four feet tall, and I've seen butterfly weed that are two feet tall. Some of that might be environmental conditions. Some of it, I think, is just, you know, the genetics of that particular plant. Um, yeah, so this plant, you know, tends not to be so tall. I would say foot and a half to two feet is maybe typical. Having said that, I have seen plants that are three feet tall. Be prepared for surprises. This is wild quinine. This is not a plant that I see very often um, when people talk about um, native plants. You know, and I, again, I really like white plants, so I'm really drawn to this. It's got an incredibly long bloom period. I would say six weeks, um, which, which is great. The other thing is it's, it's in the wild, it is really declining. Um, there's very few populations of it left in the wild in our area of the country anyway. So I really try to encourage people to plant this. And it, it, it you know, I, the, the white, if you put that white against the right plant, it can make other things look just spectacular. This is not in my garden. Um, you know, if I had a plant this beautiful in my garden, I would put it against something really intensely colored, I think, and it would be great. Oh, it's a um, the uh, it's it's got a, a a seed that the birds really like too. I see the the finches on this a lot as well in the late summer fall. Don't do that. Great headed coneflower, sometimes called yellow coneflower. Uh, probably got a half a dozen different Ratibida pinata. Um, I like. This specifically, you know, it's, it meets all of the criteria. It's a great pollinator plant. It'll grow in really dry, crappy soil. Um, the birds like the seeds. I like the color of this yellow, if that is a weird reason for liking a plant. I mean, a lot of the yellow colored daisy-like flowers seem to bend much more to gold um, than this does. Um, sometimes if you catch this, this plant in, in good sunlight, it's just like, it's got this lemony translucence to it that, you know, I just, like I said, sometimes you just got to go out in the garden and stare at stuff to, to really enjoy this. So, um, this, this is one that I have learned can get, oh, um, you know, I have it in the prairie and it's really well behaved and it stands up and it doesn't fall over. Um, in the garden, I stake it. It's just too lush, too lush. Spiderwort, um, great color, long bloom period. Um, as I said, I have this planted behind my greenhouse, a large span of it with that um, golden Alexander. They bloom simultaneously. It's a great combination. When they're both done blooming, it looks pretty ratty back there. I take the weed whip, I mow the whole thing to the ground and I'll get new foliage. Sometimes the spider wart reblooms. Um, usually I, I've not had the um, golden Alexanders rebloom, but I have learned that if I get, if I cut them to the ground and I get new foliage, that new growth foliage is more attractive to the caterpillars, to the um, swallowtail caterpillars than the old older left behind stuff is. So just uh, just saying. So traditional black eyed Susan, I don't think there's much to be said, much more that needs to be said about that, except I will point out that I don't consider these perennials. I consider them annuals, winter annuals, um, short lived perennials, biennials, they are not long lived. So, um, you know, if you've got a plant someplace one year, don't expect to see it there next year. Very likely you can get lots of progeny from it though. This is the cup plant that we talked about, um, you know, earlier, you can see the little cup down here. This is showing better, better blooms for it. You know, again, I, I, I really like that lemony yellow and this looks really great. 
Um, this blooms later in the summer. And so it looks really good with things like the ironweed. Um, oh, the New England aster is kind of behind that, but this looks really nice with the ironweed. Purple stuff, that yellow and purple, and we can all be Viking stands or something like that. Native lupin. Um, you know, I have found this to be an exceptionally challenging plant to grow. Um, it is not the, 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 um, the, the lupin that we see in the road ditches or that we buy from the seed catalogs. This native lupin is um, um, much shorter at about um, foot and a half to two feet tall. It likes very dry soil. It takes a while to establish much more so than, uh, um, you know, the ones that you see in the road ditches when you go up to northern Minnesota, um, those are garden escapes. Those are not native lupins. This is the native lupin in Minnesota. And its appearance and both its cultural requirements are different. This is Michigan lily. Um, uh, you know, this is, this is not easy to grow, but it, it is a beautiful plant. Um, you know, just that's all I'm going to say. <clears throat> Rattlesnake Master. Um, this is, uh, I like this because it's funky. I don't know what else to say. It's just, I, again, I think I, I am kind of drawn to plants that have a certain kind of architecture to them that I think will make other plants look good or, you know, like it creates some, something going on in that garden that just I find attractive. So it's easy, it's pest free. It's actually, it's a prairie species. I've got a fair amount of it growing in my prairie. And it's one of those plants that if you've got rattlesnake master in your prairie, that means your prairie's coming along just fine, thank you. It's, it's one of the more, um, not one of the pioneer early species that's indicative of a more mature prairie. And, and yeah, here, pest free. And, and it stands up on its own, which is great, so. Makes a great cut flower too, by the way. Uh, prairie onion, there's a couple of, um, this is, uh, there's, oh, I wanna say four or five native onions in Minnesota. I like this one and the other one that I really like is the, the nodding onion, kind of similar, except that the nodding onion kind of um, is a little bit more pendant um, and the nodding onion will grow in a little bit more shade. This is definitely a dry, sunny one. The nodding onion will grow in some uh, semi-shade and moisture condition. Alum root, um, yeah, Pucara richardsoni, I get that. So this is related to um, the coral bell, I think, which is obvious um, from the, the appearance and particularly the flower stock. This will grow in very poor soil conditions. Um, I think the flowers are not particularly attractive looking. But you know what? I and I I I almost wanted to cut them down. Some years I almost am tempted to cut them back, but they are just teeming with little bees. So I can't cut that down. Prairie but I mentioned grasses. Um, this is prairie drop seed. Um, this is probably my favorite native grass. Um, I, and, and, and I'm really heartened to see this being used a lot, lot more as in that garden that I showed earlier, that one at the Children's Museum. And I'm actually seeing this used a lot in um, like, um, I live close, I, I shop in Northfield. So this is in the, um, the parking lot medians in the um, Aldi grocery store in Northfield. Um, I've seen it in, uh, you know, used, used in a lot of commercial landscape plantings. It's a very tough, long lived, attractive, grass. Um, and like I said, enough already with the Carl Forrester. Why not this guy? Lead plant. This is a little shrub. Um, you know, I think the other, it's a, a, a prairie shrub. There aren't a lot of woodies that grow in the prairie. This one and then that um, New Jersey tea that I spoke of earlier are a couple of examples. This is one with one of those ones that has, yes, the roots are 12 feet long. Um, I love the foliage on this. Um, I have good luck with this plant if I um, prune it somewhat in the spring so that it doesn't get so tall and leggy. I think it's, um, you know, in the, in the prairie, um, I have noticed in our prairie, this looks most stunning the year after we have a burn. 
So it's been burned all the way to the ground. And so all of the growth that year is, is, is new growth and, and they just look wonderful. I have some very old plants that are about 15 years old, never burned, been burned. They look kind of leggy and woody. Um, so this is one in my garden. I do, I do prune it pretty heavily in the spring. Great butterfly plant. Yeah, it's a legume. It can be, if you've got monies, it's yeah, good, good one to cage um, initially. Violet wood sorrel, this is, um, I, this is kind of obscure. I think it's not well known, but um, this is another spring ephemeral. But unlike a lot of the spring ephemerals, which are woodlanders, this actually grows in dry, really dry, sandy conditions. It has little bulbs. It's easy to move, you know, if you want to divide it or spread it around, that's fine. Here's a New Jersey tea that we spoke of um, earlier. Um, you know, and I, I should mention here too, um, I do also prune this one back in the spring, probably to about a foot. Um, I just get a better looking plant out of it. Um, not so leggy and woody looking, certainly not necessary, but uh, you know, depending upon your inclinations, um, it can look better. This is a great nectar plant. Okay, I think I'm just about at the end. I do always like to close with a list of resources. Um, I am a member of Wild Ones. I don't know if um, people in your group are familiar with that. I'm actually the vice president of our Northfield chapter. So I would be remiss if I did not encourage you to become a, a member of either our chapter. There's a couple of chapters up in the metro area. So, you know, and even if you don't become a member, you know, their presentations are always free and open to the public. So go. Um, I'm going to refer you to one website. It's called Minnesota Native Intelligence. Um, and from there, it can take you to a multitude of sites that um, will tell you about where to buy plants, how to design gardens, you know, who our vendors are, what are good plants for rain gardens, what are good pollinator plants. Just, you know, she's, and, and, and this woman, she's, um, she just, you know, she just did this for fun, but she's just done an excellent job of um, addressing Minnesota and saying, here's where you can go. If you are interested in native plants, here's just a ton of resources for you. So um, the other really, really good website is Minnesota Wildflower website. This is, um, I consider this a really good site for IDing plants. If you're out, you know, and you run across a plant, um, that's, um, you know, they, they are cataloging all, all the flowers, ferns, I don't know if they're shrubs, grasses, they're, they're, they're trying to catalog all of Minnesota natives plants. And they've got just, I mean, it's solid, accurate information. Doesn't give a lot of cultural information that helps you figure out how, well, how would this work in a garden? For that, I would say, you know, go to Missouri, Missouri Botanical Gardens of all places has I think an excellent website for how do you take a native plant and make it work in a garden. I think the Xerxes Society has just a ton of very good information. Um, and, 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 and in recent years, they've extended their reach. Um, you know, it's like, yeah, we, we're about insects, but you know what? Insects are about plants. So we've got tons of information. I mean, you can get garden designs from them, just tons of stuff. Um, and then these last two are, you know, I know I've been doing this for way too long. When I used to put together a list of resources and there were no websites on it, it was just like, well, here's my favorite books about native plants. Or here's, you know, so in, in most of that, I've kind of let go, except these two items, the Prairie Moon Seed Catalog of all things. Um, you know, I, I used to tell people I, Never, I never was without a copy of this one on my desk and one at my bedside. And that's honest to God's truth. And there's probably still a Prairie Moon seed catalog sitting by my bedside as we speak. I know it's a seed catalog, but it's just got great information on um, height, color, bloom time, soil conditions. Is it a pollinator? Is it deer resistant? Um, they sell seeds, they sell plants, even if you don't wanna buy from them. That seed catalog is a great idea. And then William Kalina, um, 
he's got he, he he is my absolute favorite garden writer of all time um he's got a series on one on native plants he's got one on native trees and shrubs um i think he's got one on ferns i don't know but this guy william kalina i mean even if i weren't a gardener i would just delight in reading him because i love his prose so much so and great great pictures so before there was the internet there was william kalina and prairie moon seed so hey there you go and i think that's it yeah